So hello and welcome to this Think Global Forum Roundtable. It's a pleasure to have you all with us today here live or if you're watching to this on a recording, we appreciate you taking the time to do so. Uh, I joined with a fantastic panel today and it's a, it's a real privilege to have Maria Roa here from the Think Global Forum team. Of course, our speaker who's going to kick us off in a moment, Phil Ritchie. Uh, and also we're joined by Tom Dore, no stranger to the world of AI, and Bruno Herman, known to many I know in the localization space. We're going to do a presentation from Phil Ritchie, CTO, about this wonderful landscape of AI, its impact on the localization area, and of course, the world of content. And then after Phil's finished his presentation, we're gonna to move to the panel and really talk through this topic a little bit more. And when we have time at the end, we'll try and squeeze in a few questions from our audience joining us live here today. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can head down to the Q&A and pop a question in at any stage, and we will try our best to answer it as we come towards the end of our time here together today. So thank you to everybody who's watching or listening to us. And uh, let's start, Phil, maybe over to you. Thanks, Simon. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll start with a, a story and um, uh, no doubt friends and uh, family will, will, will enjoy the irony of it. Um, you know, as a, as a CTO, I, I'm a, in a very lucky position. I have the luxury a lot of time uh, when I'm talking to people to tell them how technology is about to change or improve or more likely disrupt and destroy parts of their, their job and um, encourage them to, you know, reskill, to get on board with technology or, and, and harness it to their advantage rather than uh, try and resist it. Then uh, just over two years ago, uh, this happened. And I have to say, it caught me quite by surprise. Um, we had been used to having, uh, if you like, single line uh, little prompts called IntelliSense in our development environments uh, that would usually suggest small pieces of uh, uh, programming code. But this, this really had a dramatic uh, kind of effect on us. And um, I, I think I dealt with it pretty well. I uh, dusted off my CV, uh, applied for several retraining grants, and uh, and and moved on. And so, you know, over over that two years, uh, you know, the the relentless pace of AI innovation, ha you know, has has just just been relentless. Uh, people have been building bigger and bigger models with more and more parameters, and it's it's quite strange that it, you know we got to the point where even the very pioneers of AI uh, issued a petition quite recently, calling for a six month suspension of training on large language models. You know because they they, they were just scared of uh, misinformation, ethical concerns, and 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 other other uh, concerns that they had. And it, it's kind of sad in a way, I suppose, that uh, you know Jeff Hinton here. Who's who's one of the the, the leading lights of AI uh, was was started starting to compare himself to Oppenheimer, which is um, you know it's 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 sad I suppose in a way. So you know I spent a lot of time uh, musing on the nature of of AI and the power of of AI platforms, and you know it, way back in in 1984 when the movie Terminator came out, um, you know, the bit that captured my imagination was the part of the storyline where they talk about a, a, a military computer system becoming self-aware. And, and that really kind of caught, caught my uh, interest in the imagination. I, I'm not sure why they use the term self-aware versus sentient, but, you know, we, we, we could uh, lead ourselves down a very deep philosophical rabbit hole uh, having a debate about that. Then we have um, the the test of uh, a computing hero of mine, uh, Alan Turing, and um, he devised a test for AI that essentially had 
an examiner talking to another human and an AI. And uh, it was said that if he couldn't, the examiner couldn't tell the difference between the AI and the other human that the AI was said to have passed the test. And, you know, there's a lot of people currently arguing about whether large language models uh, pass that test currently. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting, the point at which, at which we are now. Um, content delivery um, has, or, or the, a kind of a, a revolution in, in mechanized content delivery has been around for a while. Uh, the Japanese, uh, I guess, have kind of led that market to a certain extent, particularly in, in the healthcare sector, where they've had robots uh, delivering help and advice and sometimes physical, uh, physical assistance for a few years now. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's quite funny. Us technologists might think that we can uh, control the way in which we want people to consume information, but uh, you, you can be sure the general public will articulate their displeasure if they don't feel that it's the most appropriate way. And then, you know, most recently, uh, a, an Indian uh, TV channel introduced their, uh, their AI news anchor uh, called Lisa. And um, the advantage of Lisa is that she speaks multiple uh, Indian dialects in addition to English. And uh, seemingly, uh, you know, audiences in India have been uh, really, uh, really welcoming this, this kind of interaction in terms of, uh, you know, picking up uh, information, particularly in a, in a kind of a news context. So it, it, in terms of the, the kind of the concrete ways in which uh, AI can um, impact content creation and delivery. You know, there's a number of, of, uh, of ways here. Um, and I think we've probably seen uh, most of them already in, a, in a, uh, an individual context. So, you know, we, we have platforms that, that can do content moderation or uh, add personalization or look at, look at um, uh, SEO. But, it, you know, la large language models uh, really come very close to having an ability to take all of these things into consideration, you know, in one go. So rather than have perhaps a multi-step process, um, you, you, you can really have a, a, a single, uh, a single uh, request or a single task and have all of these, all of these things built into it from, from day one, which is, which is very interesting. And, and in a sense, you know, we, we're almost kind of getting to this minority report kind of scenario where the moment you walk into a shopping mall, um, once you're identified, you start getting uh, very targeted information uh, pushed at you. And that's, that's kind of both scary and interesting at the same time, I suppose. Uh, I'll say uh, a little bit about uh, what we're doing in, in Vista Tech. Um, I think the first one here is, is my favorite. Um, I, I have heard of a lot of companies um, closing down access to Gen AI because they're you know, concerned about, uh, quite rightly concerned about security and privacy. But um, I'm proud of the fact that here uh, we've been able to provide all of our employees with access to a secure and private instance. And we've really you know, empowered and encouraged everybody in the in the office to to go away, to learn, to experiment, and to you know really find out where they think um, Gen AI can help them during their day to day business. And you know, it's a great way to get people on board with the technology and to to upskill themselves. So that's that's kind of my favorite one, I think. Um, automated target uh, content generation. Um, I think this is an exciting one from uh, a marketing perspective. Uh, we do a fair bit of uh, content uh, creation for customers, but generally, you know, we, we author something in English and then you, you, it's kind of adapted for the target market. 
I think this is very interesting from the perspective that you could go direct to target market and, and possibly uh, make the content, uh, you know, much more targeted to that, that destination than you would if you were, you know, authoring in a, in a more abstract way. So I think that's, that's really interesting. Uh, neural network MT versus Gen AI. Uh, I think there's, you know, it's fairly well uh, known um, at the moment that generative AI uh, possibly has better fluency, um, but, you know, obviously because it's been trained on a much broader uh, set of content that it's, it's, um, it's domain specificity and, and um, terminology is perhaps not as good uh, as Gen AI, but you know we're 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 doing some pilots there uh, to figure out exactly you know where those differences are and can they be you know can we fine tune Gen AI for example with terminology as we do with with neural network MT quality assessment and estimation uh, the big difference there is that we're um, the quality assessment is is assessing quality with reference to a, a goal translation. So if we already have a, a translation in that target language and we get a, a, a new machine translation, for example, we're, we're kind of assessing the quality uh, between the gold standard and the, the new output. Um, the quality estimation is much more establishing a, uh, a quality assessment on its own basis. There's, there's no, reference, uh, no reference translation there. Our uh, tech ops people are looking at all kinds of uh, technologies uh, to help with uh, text extraction and preparation for translation. So lots of things to do with uh, particularly multimedia uh, type uh, assets, extraction of text, creation of subtitles, all those kinds of wonderful things. And then my team in particular is looking at uh, integrating AI into a lot of our internal applications. So uh, currently uh, we have applications for resource assignment, language quality and query management. And we're looking at folding in uh, AI into those, into those tools, which is, which is very exciting. In terms of findings to date, um, you know, we, we do intend to publish uh, white papers on some of the pilots that we're doing so that you can get more, uh, more specifics on things. But I think, you know, in terms of general kind of uh, feedbacks, like, like MT, uh, you know, there are variations uh, in quality and effectiveness depending on uh, language, uh, content type, domain. And, you know, again, I think that's, that's not unusual uh, given given the broadness uh, that Gen AI is is working from, uh, but there's some some interesting uh, some interesting avenues there. Um, and then I think um, the way that you frame the task to uh, Gen AI is is really really important. I think the term prompt engineering has entered the 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 general vernacular at this point, but the the idea that you have to uh, think carefully about the question you're asking uh, AI uh, is is very important. And we, you know we did some some very early kind of naive tests uh, w when we were first looking at this, uh, and I have some examples uh, here for you. So uh, here uh, we were simply asking um, chat GPT to evaluate a translation from English into Italian. And you can see it, it, it comes back with, with answers that are primarily focused on uh, the, the, the correctness of the translation and whether the, uh, the original meaning has been, been maintained. So uh, useful information, um, but, but you know, quite, uh, quite uh, constrained in, in what it's telling you. We then had a look at um, some plugins. So, here um, you have kind of a, a, a third party in the middle, as it were. So we're, we're asking exactly the same question, but in this instance, the question goes to the third party uh, plugin provider. 
they have the ability to massage the question that's sent to the AI. And then also on the way back out, they have an opportunity to do something with it. And, and here you can see, you know, we, we get a, a different type of answer. The, the system was obviously asked um, to classify the translation according to some, some uh, buckets, if you like. So he, here it says, uh, you know, it, it's rated as fair. So they probably had classifications like good and perfect and poor or, or whatever it might be. And, and then we get some general uh, feedback again on, on the accuracy of the translation. But then if we um, take the plugin out of the equation again, and this time we uh, give perhaps a more directed question or, or uh, a more accurately phrased question, and we actually ask for a linguistic critique rather than just you know, evaluate this translation. And here you can see we get much more of a breakdown. There's, um, uh, it, it's paid attention not only to whether translations are correct uh, and understandable, but it also talks about using alternative phrasing for formal text and uh, considering the use of other verbs and, and things like that. So it's a much more conversational type of uh, answer that you get. So, and we've been finding this throughout um, the pilots that we've been doing this, that, you know, you really have to uh, think carefully about how you interact uh, with the AI. Uh, do I use it? Uh, absolutely, every day, every day, uh, for all kinds of things. Um, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really quite engaging. Um, I have to tell you, it, if this had been around, um, when my children were teenagers, I probably would, would have used it during negotiations around curfews and, and all kinds of things like, um, you know, it's it's really it's really interesting. I, I certainly don't give it uh, personal information and I don't take everything it says as 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 gospel. But, um, you know, I think it's very interesting not only to um, to to get it to justify the answers that it's giving you, but also to to have it give you answers from different perspectives as well. Um, and, and I find it very useful in, in just all kinds of situations where you're trying to reason your way through, uh, through a business problem. Uh, in terms of what's next, uh, I, I have to say, I, I'm not capable of anything close to reliable prediction myself, um, but there's, there's probably two, um, quite large areas uh, that people are investing money into that 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 will be fruitful um one is um i think the larger corporations who perhaps have um a little more of a skill set and um and a budget to match will start to fine tune their own large language models and really produce ais that they can use within their own business uh, contexts, you know, particularly for inferencing around um, corporate corporate data and and things that they want that are very proprietary to themselves. Excuse me. And then um, there are also uh, a good few people working on uh, frameworks for pipelining and chaining uh, large language models with other facilities. So, for example, um, APIs, computation engines, knowledge bases. And you know we can see that people like Google are already working on these kinds of uh, pipelines in order to um, have them cope with end-to-end end-to-end -end tasks like you know book me a flight, make me a dental appointment, all those kinds of things. Um, so I think that's that's certainly two areas where you know we'll we'll see uh, things grow. But um, you know overall, I I think it's very exciting. As I say, I'm very pleased that 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 we in particular have have given all of our employees you know an amount of empowerment around this to to experiment with it and um it's it's very very interesting thank you well thank you phil um you, you've certainly um give us a lot of context there we've covered everything from um the turing test to self-aware uh sentient um terminators uh where we kicked us off uh, but you've, you've also touched on relentless growth which is really interesting uh fascinated to see the the, the indian dialects and the um the sort of ai agent if you like uh that's that's generated there you mentioned security and privacy 
you know, you, you talked a bit about the quality assessments and also the implementation of AI into VistaTech's own internal applications. Uh, and that's sort of allowing people to go off and, and uh, use this and really figure out use cases as well, that empowerment. Uh, and of course, the what's next is a sort of a bit of an open-ended question. Um, but I want to bring in, if I can, at this stage, Phil, I want to bring in both maybe Bruno and Tom. And maybe, maybe Bruno, if we, we start with you, maybe just some of your thoughts, questions or opinions on what we've been sort of kicking off here. So thank you, Phil, for a, a great start to today's proceedings. Let's bring the wider panel in. Yes. Um, yeah, and to be honest, I share the excitement of, of Phil regarding AI. Uh, I know in this field, there are two groups of people, uh, pessimistic and optimistic people. I belong to the second group. I'm definitely optimistic uh, for all the reasons that Phil mentioned in his presentation. Uh, and I would say that um, the, the, the way I see the impact of AI on localization, but also on other areas of content management, uh, it must be, of course, value around value, value creation. And I think that's very important. Uh, you, you know, um, you just mentioned Simon empowerment. You mentioned other, you know, other benefits of AI for a people. And I think that that's very important that even in a business, in a business framework, we all keep focus, we stay focused on the value creation or how AI is going to increase the value for the business and for the customers eventually. And I, and I think, you know, uh, usually I tend to sort of split my view into three parts, which is the people, the processes or the operations and the technology. And I think, you know, these three areas are going to be and already actually uh, heavily impacted by AI, positively in my view, but of course not everybody probably would agree. Uh, but if we look at, if I look at the people, for instance, in the localization industry or in the language industry in general, uh, of course, there will, there will be big changes. There are big changes already going on in terms of project management. It's no longer based on files. Project management is going to be around, you know, data services, content services. So more data, less files, for instance. So that's a big change for project managers. And uh, for linguists, uh, I know I, I got the question on a regular basis, why are you so excited about something that's going to kill linguists? I said, no, it's not going to kill any linguist. I, I think it's going to empower, it's going to enable linguists who are today probably limited to a number of tasks which are related to post-editing or to you know, language analysis. Because of the nature of AI, which is based on data and not on files, linguists will have more tasks. They will have more, more, uh, more opportunities. Uh, to actually use and maximize their linguistic skills, uh, you know, instead of just just sticking to you know the traditional task of a linguist. So these are two examples: project management and language management, which, in my opinion, show that uh, you know uh, AI can and will have a positive impact on what people are and do. In terms of processes and technology, yeah, there is a big change as well. Obviously, as I said, AI has made data even more important than before. Uh, I know for years people have been saying, yeah, data is a new oil. Uh, I would say that now, today with AI, language data is a new oil. And I think many organizations are sitting, that's what I see, uh, or I've been seeing that for quite a number of years now, uh, before when I was an employee and now when I'm a consultant, I see that a number of organizations are sitting on gold mines. I call that gold mines because they have plenty of files, sometimes millions of files that are containing really critical information for the business. Uh, this might be customer service files. This might be uh, product information files. And these files are in multiple languages. They are in multiple formats. They are audio, text, video, whatever. And all these assets must be, they will have to be in some way converted into data, language data, to train and feed AI engine machine learning, because machine learning will not be fed with, it, with files, it will be fed with data. And that data will have to be relevant, actionable, and of course, clean. Uh, so in terms of operations, that brings some new opportunities again, some challenges, I agree, but these are also opportunities from my perspective, just to be able 
to you know maximize and to leverage AI the way it should be, and you know instead of being scared of it, you know maximize it, use it, embrace it to actually do things better and faster. And then technology, that's another one. Uh, well, of course, in local in, in the language industry or in the localization industry, uh, it's obvious that technology has always played a big role. Uh, and again, here, uh, data, the way data services and content services, I would say, are going to be managed uh, is going to be critical. Uh, I think that um, for a number of years and even decades, uh, technology in the language services industry has been focused on, uh, you know, the transaction of files, or as I said, you know, some uh, some well-established, you know, uh, tasks in the workflow in the supply chain. And now there is a brand new open space, which is really exciting from my perspective, which is that you know both organizations, so buyers and suppliers of content services, uh, can really use and can really participate to the creation of this language data that's going to that's going to be so important so that would be that will have to be part in my opinion data services and content services will have to be part of the tech stack of any organization sooner rather than later thank you bruno and you made some excellent points there again that word empowerment came up and this these these sort of data gold mines uh, if i can use that phrase and we've seen a lot of conversation around that at the moment, in particular that 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 sort of content, you know, and that whether it's oil or gold or whatever term you want to use. But I think companies are really realizing that they are sitting on this uh, fantastic asset and, you know, bringing that into multiple languages and using the power of AI to make that accessible to people. And Phil was touching on that, wasn't he, in terms of, you know, larger organizations training their own models on their own bespoke data and the importance of that and the the benefits that we see to that but let's bring tom in because tom i know you're sort of at the cross section with what you do in the world of ai in terms of marketing content so what about what we're talking about so far any sort of early observations here tom yeah i mean i'd certainly uh echo phil and bruno uh with their optimism optimism around ai and and it's you know potential to have a positive impact on the world and on the way we're doing things in business um you, from a from a point of view of content uh you know my background is marketing i i help businesses adopt ai uh to enhance their marketing execution and the outcomes of the the work that their marketing teams do um and it's not unique to content but but you know being able to take some of the weight off uh the shoulders of of some of the knowledge workers um you know, who have to do a lot of thinking up front. Um, in this case, if it was, uh, you know, creating content and, and coming up with, uh, if it's for for the purposes of marketing, a content marketing strategy or, or sales enablement content. Um, and then they go through the process to get it uh, localized and translated further down the line. If they can know that they're able to spend more of their time up front considering, you know, cultural nuances and uh, the impact of, of what they're trying to achieve through content in different uh, regions and different languages uh, in different segments of their audience. Uh, and then they can leverage uh, AI and their workflows that they've integrated AI to, to uh, create that content, um, you know, and, and do more of the, uh, the legwork, then it frees them up to, to, you know, be more creative, be more impactful. Uh, and through that, you know, at scale, um, like Bruno said, doing, doing things better and faster, uh, you know, in the world of marketing, the key is, is to test and evolve and test and optimize. So the more you can do, uh, the more you can learn about the effectiveness of what you're doing, uh, and then how you can do better. Uh, so when it comes to content, being able to uh, spend more of your time thinking strategically up front, uh, getting the work, some of the work um, automated or, or uh, enabled or augmented uh, with the help of AI and then executed at a faster rate at a higher scale to then get more data and understand the impact of that, uh, that content and that work. If it's, you know, if we're, if we're thinking of content marketing, even as simple as, as creating blogs or email, email uh, automation and, and marketing through email channels, um, you know, if you can have more numbers to work with, you can make more strategic decisions uh, in a in a quick succession and, and have a higher velocity of improvements to the work that you're doing. And, um, 
you know, that's not just like having more talented people on the team or having suddenly increasing your headcount on your marketing team. Uh, it's somehow applying, you know, years of improvement uh, that that wouldn't have been possible in a short space of time without AI. And, and you know, it's such a, uh, a step change from the way things are done now uh, that I, I don't know if many businesses are ready for that pace of improvement uh, or they're geared up to be. Uh, and if they're not, their competition might be. So, you know, it poses a, an interesting challenge and opportunity dynamic um, for for businesses is how fast they can they can adopt AI uh, for some of these processes to be successful versus some of the precautions and the steps they might want to take to be able to do that and finding that balance. But, um, you know, going beyond that, the personalization and segmentation uh, of, of marketing efforts uh, always has a correlation with its impact, you know, so you can do big sweeping marketing campaigns and, and create content at a very broad level. But uh, where we see real impact is when that gets more and more segmented and, and customized and tailored to the individual. And that's not really possible for many businesses at a huge scale. You know, they might do uh, a couple of different key buyers in their, you know, persona map, or they might change things for the U S market versus some of the U uh, European markets. And, uh, but with the, the use of, uh, different tools within the AI technology stack, they can uh, they can make things hyper personalized and hyper tailored to local markets and and multiple sub segments, you know, with any different group. And then, you know, even using other tools to to tailor things to a one to one personalization uh, level, um, you know, being able to couple that with spending more of their time making data driven strategic decisions at a faster pace, uh, it's an explosion of possibilities uh in terms of the impact from a from a marketing perspective and i know i come back to marketing but most of this is agnostic of of marketing you know it applies to many areas of a business but um <clears throat> yeah and and so much of this is is less cost prohibitive than uh it has been in the past you know large scale localization and translation of content is something that that isn't within the the bandwidth the budget of of a lot of smaller and medium sized businesses, you know, so the, the barrier to entry to different markets beyond their own local one, uh, it's often, you know, that they just can't localize their efforts, uh, not just from marketing, but, uh, you know, they can't, they can't translate their website effectively, or, or they can't build PowerPoints. And, you know, I had a, I had a zoom call with someone in Brazil, uh, the other day with a real time translation integration that they set up. Um, I think it was before, called Kudo. And we just had a conversation and I heard him in English and he heard me in Portuguese, I'm assuming. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that's just one part of this process that uh, wouldn't have been possible for much smaller businesses or individuals or, or smaller companies, um, you know, and it's kind of leveling the playing field for some of these uh, technologies to be adopted. Uh, so it's an extremely exciting time. Thanks, Tom. And I, I think going back to that, relentless growth that Phil was talking about. I think you made an excellent point that maybe some of the companies, whether they're small, medium, or the biggest companies on the planet, are you ready for this fast pace that, that this is coming down? As Phil said, it's there's a relentless growth here. Bruno and Phil, you both mentioned that I think the initial reaction from some, whether it was the linguistic community or the technology community was, okay, I better dust down the CV. This is going to replace everybody. And then we sort of come full circle on that argument. Now we're into, look at the superpowers we have as humans. If we sort of implement this with us, it's sort of the, the human in the loop, that sort of human plus AI. Look at all this heavy lifting we can move. And Phil was talking about how Vistec is implementing AI into a number of its internal applications and some of the what that future roadmap looks like. But Maria, uh, I want to bring you in because I know you've got some questions here on this topic. Maybe you can share some of those with our panel. And if you put questions into the Q&A, we do see them. We see Charles and uh, E.T. and a few others popping questions in. So please feel free to put your questions in and we will come to a Q&A at the end. But Maria, just some initial observations and maybe some thoughts or questions for our panel. 
Yeah, I just want to say first that uh, Tom just hit a point that I wanted to talk about, and it's all these key essential factors that people need to consider when approaching to implement artificial intelligence into a localization process. He was talking about all these cultural nuances uh, that we need to take into account, and it's something that obviously a localization expert uh, knows, like a date, number of formats, currency symbols, uh, multimedia elements, uh, I don't know, idiomatic expressions. But he is right. Uh, artificial intelligence could help a lot. And it is amazing what uh, a heavy lifting AI can do for us. But is there any other examples that any of you can think of how AI can improve content creation processes apart from this? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I certainly have used it to um, not not create outlines uh, from scratch, but I've I've uh, you know maybe maybe put down an outline myself of things that I wanted to talk about, uh, some some ideas, you know, some some small fleshing out, and then give it to the AI and say, you know, what what things have I missed? Is there a better way mm -hmm. of expressing uh, a topic? Um, and, and getting you know having it having it uh, provide a critique. Uh, as to whether it's um, you know understandable or complete or whatever, so I, I think yeah, there there are definitely uh, ways there that it, that you can you can get it to help you, um, you know, because by the time you'd uh, crafted a suitable prompt to write, you know, to write the outline for you, <laughs> you you'd be there for for a good few days. So it, it's it's you know the fact that you can give it something um and and have it have it provide a critique is is a useful mechanism so is it like a reviewer of your work so you get like a second hand or a second help, yeah a second yeah, like eye a, on like your a, work like an editor yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. that'd be great yeah 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 i kind of yeah. oh sorry stop but uh, okay i kind of adding to that the um you know a lot of people don't consider uh that as much as you're using ai um in any respect but when it comes to generative ai you don't have to use everything that's being generated and and when you're uh if you're not using ai if you're using you know uh staff or contractors or freelancers or or you know uh a vendor or supplier to to create anything um it's tremendously wasteful to not use the things they're creating and, and it can be frustrating to you know provide a brief or instructions and then the work comes back and it's perhaps perhaps missed the mark in in your mind or or wasn't quite what you had in mind uh and you may be worried that you didn't give enough information uh or enough of a good brief to get what you wanted um being able to use uh even just chat gpt and and refine your prompt engineering to understand you know based on what input you give it uh what you get out to learn more around uh how you're instructing the AI or the people that you work with, um, I found incredibly useful. And I've seen teams, you know, find that really useful to just dedicate some time to uh, refining their, their prompt engineering uh, and not worrying about using the output uh, for anything, you know, so they can kind of get their, their brief set and then maybe, uh, you know, apply that at scale and, and try that a, a bunch of times with some QA steps, but they're not, they're not trying to leverage whatever's being created from, from step one. And, uh, I think it's it's been a really useful part of the process to make people recognize how responsible they are for the outcomes and the output of the you know the process and the, and the work being created. It's not purely down to whoever it's being handed to. Uh, so that I, I you know I found that a, a really interesting part of the content creation process. Bruno, were you going to add a comment there? Were you? Yeah, I just had a, a, another example of benefit of AI. Uh, for the content creation part of the supply chain. Um, and I would say that from my perspective, AI is raising the bar of content readiness for localization and globalization purposes. Uh, so what I mean here is that if you look at the whole supply chain from creation to delivery, you have, of course, localization, translation localization uh, in, in the supply chain, but uh, you can ask a number of people in the localization translation areas that you know they will complain about the quality or the effectiveness of the source content because they will say that you know it's garbage so garbage in garbage out 
So they don't want to be blamed for a lack of effectiveness in the localized content because the source content hasn't been created properly. So what AI, what I see now is that AI is really raising the bar in terms of source content uh, readiness for localization by actually, you know, creating this output, which is not going to be perfect. But since the people in charge of content creation will have more time to fine tune this source content, which might be in English or other languages, then the bar of effectiveness will be raised. And because of that, I would say there will be some sort of ripple effect in the rest of the supply chain, because uh, if people are able to create better content, when I say better, I mean content that is more ready for translation and localization, then of course, localization teams will have also more time to fine tune the content on their side. So there would be some sort of, as I said, you know, virtual circle uh, that is going to be really uh, applicable to the whole supply chain, but that will start in content creation just because AI will generate output that's not going to be perfect, but that's going to be quick and already usable, perfectable. And then, you know, the creators, as I call them, or the, the content producers, uh, because they will have more time, they won't have any, any sort of excuse to say, oh, sorry, I didn't time... I didn't have time to make it perfect for translation purposes or localization purposes. Uh, no, it's not going to be valid anymore. And I think that that's really where you know AI is is really creating a lot of value at the creation side. Yeah, very very good points. Thank you uh, for your for your inputs there, um, Maria. I hope that gives us a little bit more clarity. Is there anything else from your side, Maria? Because I'm very conscious we've got some great questions coming in from the audience as well. And I do want to bring some of those in, but Maria, what about from your side? If we have a couple minutes, I would just like to know if they found any challenges on implementing AI in content creation or work workflow processes in Tom's uh, situation. Because I know AI is still something, let's say new, although it's been there for a bit. So is there any challenges that you guys find that there's a still a lot to work on? Yeah, I think any process that involves humans is is always going to have errors and issues and flaws. Um, and, you know, the AI is only going to be as good as it is and, and uh, it can produce to a maximum quality or, or capacity. Um, and it's up to us to be able to um, you know, engineer prompts to to have a, a QA workflow uh, and and have the necessary steps in there to to deliver the outcome that we're expecting. But just in in creating processes and and using tools and softwares to to enable that, this is all very new to to a lot of teams, regardless of, of their profession. So stuff takes time to get used to, and people are, are, are learning on the go. And um, I think there's a bit of uh, for some people who are very eager and enthusiastic. Um, there's a bit of a rush to to be seen as the the team or the individual within an organization who's the fastest to adopt uh, AI and and the champion of AI internally and you know with any technology or anything really that can pose its own risks because they're um, you know they maybe overlook certain things and they they don't account for some of the errors that could be uh, created or really the quality of work or anything like that. Um, you know, and that can pose real risks if you if you work in certain industries, healthcare or finance, and you have content being created that isn't you know properly vetted or, or briefed or QA'd, um, you can get yourselves in trouble. So uh, I think companies having you know people rushing into this without much guidance and, and empowerment, uh, and and companies lacking uh, you know policy or, or an oversight committee or any of the steps really necessary to to have meaningful adoption. Um, it's just ripe with with risks. So with that comes you know issues and challenges in in the in the process of creation. But uh, many can be unique to the business, but but the risks there are fairly universal. Thank you, Tom. Um, well, look at this stage. I'm very keen that we don't run out of time because we've got some really great questions coming in that I I can get put to our panel from people who have joined us here live today and. The first one I'm going to put out is to everybody. It's from Tim Arata. Tim, thanks very much indeed for your question. And Tim's question is is really around Gen AI. Um, and Tim says that Gen AI disrupts 
the traditional global content workflow, you know, source, localization, team, translation, lock team, stakeholder, uh, to publishing. So content management uh, uh, becomes challenging. Can you, writing, you know, and content management becomes challenging. Can you see anyone or any tool that addresses this challenge? So, you know, as Gen A disrupts that sort of traditional global content workflow, basically, you know, when it comes to content management, as it becomes more and more challenging, is there any tool that you think addresses this challenge well at the moment? Maybe I can start. Um, I don't see any tool, but I do see a solution that can help with that, which is to implement uh, what some people call the marketplace or an ecosystem that is going to be integrating uh, Gen AI in the workflows or the workflow if there is only one. Uh, so that this Gen AI is going to be not just used as an isolated tool, but it's going to be used as a real component of a tech stack. What I personally, I like to call that ecosystem. Uh, where, you know, somebody will be responsible for co some content can use Gen AI as a component to create content, but at the same time, he will be able to use other potential tools to refine that content and actually to, as I said before, to uh, no longer use content as files, but to use content as data, uh, which is something that I see in some organizations now. When they talk about content, they don't talk about files anymore. They talk about directly native data. And I think that Gen AI can be you know, a, a, a great component of this uh, ecosystem. Uh, personally, I, I have not seen yet, maybe there is one, I haven't seen a tool that can really, as itself, as such, can be you know, a, a sort of um, you know, um, a silver bullet uh, for, uh, you know, for, the, for, for the people in charge of content creation. Uh, and and the, the other reason why I believe ecosystems are probably, an ecosystem is probably a good solution rather than a tool, is that in my opinion, and I, I, I'm working on a project with, with a client now that is hesitating between using multilingual data scientists or data-driven linguists to do the work in content creation. And it reminds me this sentence that, you know, some people said in the past, I don't need a, a linguist because, you know, I have members of my team who are multilingual, but is a multilingual person, uh, you know, enough to do, you know, to create or even to, to you know, to, to test multilingual content? No, it's not because you are multilingual that you are a linguist. So I think I, I said to that client, I wouldn't use, you know, multilingual data scientists only. I think an ecosystem also enables the collaboration between data scientists and language experts, you know, linguists, translators, so copywriters. So I think this this also brings people together more than more than just workflow components together. Thanks, thanks, Bruno. In the interest of time, guys, and I know we've probably all got uh, views on this, but I just want to put a couple of more things to the panel. And this is from Charles uh, Tidswell. Thanks, Charles, uh, for your question. It's about. The translation or task requires multiple people. And even if the prompt is the same, and we talked about prompt engineering earlier, Phil, you were talking about refining that, that prompt and critiquing the answer and giving it better instructions. Um, but even if the prompt is the same, the output could be different based on the temperature, the frequency, you know, presence type penalties. Uh, have you therefore, or do we therefore need to realign your sort of internal processes to ensure that all these different flavors of a possible translation concludes with a single source of truth and I suppose accuracy, if I could maybe add to what Charles is asking. I think it's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I was thinking on Tim's question there and you could imagine uh, content management systems um, rather than storing a, a piece of, of, of content um, are more storing uh, those, those parameters, if you like. So it stores perhaps a draft outline, but it also stores the prompt template that was used and, and things like these temperature parameters that were used just so that people have an ability to, 
to not only reproduce the content but to to tweak it as well um you know it, it, there's no point in arriving at a, an optimal uh output and then somebody throws away the prompt and and you're thinking well how on earth did we generate that the last time um so that that's probably quite interesting in terms of systems that will you know begin to manage those kinds of things um so that and perhaps even uh you know generate prompts for you i i know of at least one company that is trying to patent um a system that creates prompts from a series of inputs so it takes kind of human input and and generates prompts for for gen ai so um yeah that there, there's certainly uh, those those aspects that are going to come into play yeah we, we've played around with a few dashboards as well and we, we've investigated where there are a few companies that are providing these sort of prompt dashboards these prompt libraries aren't there where you can sort of put those in place for businesses are you seeing much of that tom from your perspective yeah and and so much of it is just uh some guy's google doc uh you know and they're they're cramming it full of stuff but you can sign up and you can pay for these things and um you know, it's it's not very expensive, but it gives you access to a wealth of stuff. And somebody has already taken the steps to, you know, back to what I was saying earlier about learning, uh, you know, how to prompt engineer and, and learning what content you get out of it. You know, it's skipping some of those steps for you. But um, there's a variety of different tools I've looked at that, that clients have used that uh, have, you know, some aspects of the prompt pre-engineered. So there's some consistency, um, you know, and that's what companies want. And that's what what a lot are looking for with these sort of enterprise solutions of things like uh, OpenAI or ChatGPT uh, Enterprise uh, to make sure that uh, to um, was it Charles's question uh, the you know there's consistency that there's a single source of truth and um, you know businesses rely on that degree of consistency but uh, you can't have people rewriting things from scratch every single time because you will just get such a, a a wide variety of of outputs yeah and i think it's two sides isn't it it's the 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 requests coming in and the cataloging of that but it's also the data that's in there right and phil kind of touched on that with companies maybe training their own models their own llms and also that sort of cataloging of this is the way that we want to bring those two um engines if you like or, or inputs if you like together um, I got another another great question here, if I can. Uh, it's from Eti e Sahai. And Bruno, she's kind of aiming this at you. Um, Eti's basically saying, is there any good real-life examples of how AI is being used to have positive impacts and positive outcomes in the project management or the language management space? Yes, I have seen some recent recently um examples of the positive impact on uh you know i would say yes land project and language management for me it's the, the content supply chain actually i call that uh and you know as i said before um i'm currently working uh, on a big project with the clients that is moving from you know uh, a file based uh, content management system to a data based language database management system so the, the beginning, uh, in the beginning, of course, uh, you don't see the, well, I haven't seen myself, the even the, the positive impact uh, coming up very obviously so that you could say, Yahoo, I found, the, I found the, the best solution with AI, but it's how it is infused, it's how it is adopted. Uh, because I think implement, implementing AI is one thing, adopting it is another thing. Uh, it's the human side of AI, if I can put it like that. So, uh, for instance, uh, as I said, you know, if AI is already now leveraged to create content properly, content that is ready for localization, then the content effectiveness, which is linguistic, cultural, and functional, so these three areas have to be covered in, in the effectiveness of content, AI can really accelerate, uh, it can expand, uh, you know, uh, raise the bar, I should say, that's the best word, raise the bar in, uh, in, in effectiveness, because people will have more time, they will be able to maximize their skills. So language analysts will be able to really uh, spend more time 
on making sure that the content is not just linguistically correct, but also culturally relevant and, and functionally uh, working. Um, and, you know, project managers will be able also to be uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, as I call them, uh, you know, uh, the middleman or the middle woman uh, of, you know, uh, of the supply chain by passing files between several people, but they will be able really to uh, leverage, uh, you know, uh, data services uh, and content services rather than just typical uh, file uh, file transaction. That's the best word I can say. So yes, I do have uh, an example. I cannot cannot mention the name of that company I'm working with now, but uh, if it is interest, she can contact me and I can tell her more about it. Uh, but I, I I think it's it's not just what I see now. It's what I hear, I was in a conference last week dedicated to language technology and most organizations, so not just Amazon and Google, but also some very interesting startups who are saying the same thing. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. Um, there's a comment from Charles. It's, he says it's not really a, a question, but he's just raising the point that this the prompt engineering can be quite binary uh, when you look at it from one angle. But what's more interesting he just wants to make the comment that it's really the roles required to tag the content and as you were talking there Bruno I was thinking about Charles's comment when you're moving people from sort of this file library to this sort of data pool or this data lake of information and how all this data becomes this really rich sort of resource for companies and I, it maybe isn't as organized at the back end as it should be and maybe that importance of content is important and it brings me on to one of the last things I wanted to put to the panel it's from uh, Gondula and Gondula makes the point about the readers you know the people that are consuming all this content we haven't really talked about it from the sort of end user's perspective or the person receiving all this wonderful information you know are they being bombarded is it too much you know shorter and shorter periods of time everybody seems to have in addition he was making the point there's trillions of posts and content out there is the human brain actually wired uh, for this kind of stuff so I suppose if I read between the lines it's a bit about making sure that AI is helping us to not just create content for the sake of content but create meaningful value um, and deliver the, the right value to the right audience so does anybody in the panel want to maybe jump in on that I I saw a very nice uh, demo uh where somebody was using AI, um, I don't recall what the what the, the topic was, but they literally said to the AI, uh, "Tell me about this topic. Give me ten high level bullet points of no more than fifty words on on you know uh, critical bits, and then and then they were able to to say, please expand." bullet number three, you know, I, I'm more interested in that. And, and then please, please expand bullet number five. So this, this, this ability to control exactly the bits you're interested in is, is, uh, you know, is very exciting. I think you, you, you really can, um, you, you know, I think what, once you realize that you can interact with the AI rather than just get, have this question and answer, uh, going on, it, it just revolutionizes the way the way that you use them. Um, and I, I, you know, I, w w one point that I didn't make in my presentation, which I think is, is kind of cool, is the way that uh, p p p certain aspects are are being democratized. So, um, in, in term in terms of the way that you you learn, uh, because you, you know you can be sitting in a meeting somebody's talking about something you have no concept of what that is and you know within a few seconds you can find out and and then really start to to join the conversation and 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 um contribute you know it, it's kind of cool um and um you know we, we we haven't really spoken too much about the positive aspects of where humans can can still stay in the loop here but you know that that people talk about human characteristics like imagination you know intuition empathy the ability to understand innuendo uh, and our ability to communicate those are all really cool things that certainly in, in Visitech we're hoping our our account managers can you know can elevate themselves and continue to use 
um, at a kind of a customer service level and, and uh, uh, you know, just, just contribute at a whole different level. Thank you, Phil. Um, I'm going to go back around just before we run out of time here today. And I'm going to ask each of the panel members just maybe to give us any sort of additional comments that maybe they're thinking of that they haven't had an opportunity to share, because I know we've had to move at a fairly rapid pace. Uh, the good news, and Phil said, you know, there's a, a couple of topics that we maybe didn't dive into as much as we could. We have another two of these roundtables coming up on this topic of AI. So you can all check out the uh, uh, thinkglobalforum.org website. The details will be there under the events tab. Uh, should you so be interested and we hope you can join us in the future but before we wrap up i'm going to go back around and just give each of our panelists an opportunity maybe to add any final thoughts anything they want to leave us with today or maybe cover anything they feel that we need to sort of emphasize here so maybe if i if i start with uh, you maria maybe can i come to you first uh, and then we'll we'll maybe finish off with you phil at the end Sure. I just want to say maybe I'm the only person whose English is not their first language. So for me, AI, it's amazing because as Phil said, for me, it's a second pair of eyes. Uh, I use it a lot for like example, Simon said, <laughs> I write in Spanish, which means like, for example, dollar signs are always after numbers or like stuff like that. It's, I know it's small things, but for me, it is always great to have that second pair of eyes when I write something and AI is helping me a lot. It helps me see which are my mistakes before I send the emails. So I get to perfection it and next time I would write it better. So I do think AI is something that you have to have on your side and use it daily. It will help you be better every day. Yeah, it's a good point. Phil was saying it's his daily go-to. Uh, but you're, you're not alone. Uh, Bruno is there with you. Don't worry. We have more than... Oh, you. it's true. But his English is much better than mine. I forgot, Bruno. <laughs> um, I, don't, maybe, I don't think so. <laughs> maybe, Tom, can we go to you next, Tom? Any sort of parting thoughts or any other things you want to touch on before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, you know, I always end up my conversations with anyone around AI, uh, trying to encourage them to spend time becoming knowledgeable, becoming familiar with with the capabilities of AI, how it can be leveraged for their daily professional life, their, their regular life at home. Um, you know, and, and the quote I always come back to uh, is that they should uh, learn with haste and proceed with caution. Uh, and, you know, and the key there is proceeding. Um, don't be the person who is left behind. Wait and see what everyone else does. Um, you know, a lot of people are worried about losing jobs to AI. Uh, they will if they don't bother to learn about AI. You know, if 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 uh, if that's a concern, make sure you're the one in the team in the organization that um, has experimented, has has taken the time to learn, has become wise in in uh, the value that AI can bring to your role, your team, your organization, uh, whatever that may be uh, beyond marketing. Um, that's my my key takeaway in, in any of my conversations. And I really try and push. I like that a lot. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Bruno, over to you. Any sort of last thoughts? Yeah, my last thoughts would be for, um, you know, how AI is perceived today. And I think, you know, every day I can read dozens of articles about, you know, uh, success stories or Hall of Shame regarding, you know, the implementation of AI. Implementing AI is very important. It's a big challenge, but adopting AI is equally important. And I think that there are less attention for the moment in general. There are less attention uh, going to, you know, how to really, just like Tom said, how to really explain, demonstrate, uh, and, and justify uh, that AI is going to create more value. It's not going to, you know, bring more human uh, or less human in the loop, it's going to, you know, change the humans that are in the loop by changing the tasks and changing the way they work. Thank you, Bruno. And Phil, you have the last word from our panel today before we wrap up. Any last thoughts or or, or sort of uh, pieces? Uh, from uh, side? No, I think I think um, uh, the one the one thing I I hope for every day is that. Um, you, you know, people use these facilities for good purposes. The, the I also look after information security in the office to an extent, and the the ingenuity of hackers and people 
to use AI for bad purposes is just boundless. Um, it, it would be lovely to see, you know, more and more stories of people using AI to, uh, you know, to address health and quality of life and all those kinds of things. So uh, that's where I hope the, the big investments are going to go. A great point. We're big supporters of AI for good, for sure. Well, look, that brings us really nicely to the end of what is part one of a three part series around this uh, interesting, fascinating and hot topic of AI. I want to personally thank everybody. I want to thank uh, Bruno Herman for being here with us today, Tom Dore, Maria Roa, and of course, Phil Ritchie. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you to everybody who has been joining us live. And of course, if you're watching this on the uh, rerun, we certainly appreciate your time today. But thank you so much indeed. I hope you can join us on the next roundtable. Please go and visit the thinkglobalforum.org, thinkglobalforum.org, and we hope to see you again soon. So thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time.